Hello, everyone. Uh, absolutely thrilled to be here with uh, what can only be described as a stellar panel. Uh, and, and I think I'd like to just start by getting all of you to just talk a little bit more, give a little bit more of an introduction of yourselves, and then we will dive right in. So, Robbie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Robbie Young. Uh, I'm the CEO of Animoca Brands. We are a global game developer, um, developing games in Web3. Um, we've been doing that for the last five years in Web3 and 12 years in, in gaming in total. And we're also one of the leading investors uh, in the Web3 space with over 380 companies in the portfolio. Hi, everyone. My name is Sébastien Borger. I'm the COO and co-founder at The Sandbox. Uh, we're a uh, decentralized gaming virtual world where anyone can make 3D content and experiences, truly own them, monetize them the way they want. We offer a wide range of avatar-centric experiences and contributing to build the open metaverse, growing an open ecosystem behind. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daria Matresh. I work at Meta, uh, formerly known as Facebook and uh, I look after Middle East, Africa, and Turkey region, over 70 countries and operations. And just to touch a little bit at Meta, uh, we have um, platforms like Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Messenger, and lately we've announced our vision for the Metaverse and rebranded ourselves as Meta, and we have another line of business in the Reality Labs. And I'm Beverly Ryder. You've had the opportunity to meet two people from my company just before us, uh, Fabio Fontana as well as Joseph Bradley, who is my CEO. So I'm the CEO of the Autonomous Venture Studios, which is a subsidiary of Neon. Been here about two years, and we're doing entrepreneurship throughout the kingdom. Excellent. And I'm Guy, and I'm with PwC Middle East. I've recently joined from Hong Kong, China. And I am all things metaverse, from strategy through to execution, helping our clients' most complex problems predominantly in the metaverse. Excellent. So uh, what's beautiful about this panel is everyone kind of runs the gamut in terms of experience and sort of where they're plugging in to the metaverse. Uh, so I think actually I'd love to start with Beverly because you're looking at this from uh, not just the startup side of things, but really how to, how to invest properly and then make companies available and solutions available more broadly. So I'd love to, to talk to you about, you know, what, what are you seeing in terms of the metaverse from, from the Neom standpoint and, yeah. and from a practical level? Yeah, so we've been very fortunate in that for Neom, it's a greenfield opportunity for the metaverse as it is physically being built. We're also able to build the metaverse simultaneously. We also have every sector that you would need in a society, and all of those are also looking at how to use the metaverse to its best advantage. I'm super fortunate that I get to build on top of the metaverse platform, and we get to build viable businesses inside of it, whether it be in the cultural side, if it's food, if it's education, or even from a workplace perspective. Excellent. And, and Guy, you really are all things metaverse because you're thinking about you know, structure and process, and improving the way we do things, but then also what is that end user experience and sort of everything in between? Well, it's wonderful that we're following uh, the presentation before from Joseph, he really kind of set the stage for the opportunity as he sees it. And we're helping clients across a range of these giga projects and mega projects that are in, in the region uh, and allowing us to help first Imagine that twin solution of what it might be so you can then investigate and explore the data. Then you can start to build metaverse solutions on top to allow that to then be broadcast to the world. So we can take things like these amazing projects that people have never seen before to allow people in other countries and other places explore them and be attracted to them. And then we can then, once they actually become part of it, they can have a private metaverse experience which is related to them as a resident or a tourist, which is, which is specifically uh, uh, kind of guarded and provided where you've got a specific experience. Yeah. And so, Daria, I, you know, I think largely we have to credit Facebook for really shining a light on the metaverse by changing their name from Facebook to Meta. I think that changed the industry and accelerated how we look at it. And so since that happened, which uh, unbelievably is only a little over a year, I mean, it's a year and a half ago, 
uh, you know, where where are you sitting today, and 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 what are you seeing in terms of opportunity and and kind of global adoption of the technology? Yes, it was a big move from us last year, changing our name, and we have been observing this trend for nearly a decade now, and it's not something new for us. We've been working on it uh, uh, for a long time, and. Um, and every technology presents with new opportunities, uh, new disruption, the way we do things, and also new risks. And Metaverse is not going to be here for another five to 10 years. And one strong learning from the internet era was technology moved fast, users adopted very fast, and regulations and governments kind of played chase and we wanted to make sure that we build Metaverse in a responsible way and also an inclusive way to start the conversation nearly 10 years before the technology is even here. So working together with the um, civil society, with regulators, with academia, with the tech industry together, thinking about how we can uh, build it responsibly uh, with more inclusion, with safety and security in mind, with privacy in mind, and uh, enabling opportunity, economic opportunity, because we won't be able to building it alone, and uh, it will be very important to, um, to collaborate on that. It's not going to be like building an app. It's going to be building the entire internet from scratch, so we have to come together, and that's the, the reason why we um, made the announcement last year, and it's been very encouraging to see that the tech is moving into the space now. Like you see all big tech is moving into the space, gaming companies and platforms. So it is exciting to see where we will be headed to. But surely it will open many opportunities. We need to do it responsibly. It, it is an exciting time. And I, I think that one of the challenges is that, you know, the general public, you know, hears things about metaverse and they immediately think, oh, it's just for games, just for social. Well, first of all, I think th that is one component of it, and it's an incredibly valuable component of it. Uh, and I, and I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing, and I think it's a good way for people to plug in. And so I'd love to hear from both of you, and maybe we'll start with you, Robbie. You know, what, what, what is the difference in, in really, you know, thinking about building games in a metaverse versus mobile sure. games and video games that we're used to? I think maybe following on a point that Daria made, um, one of the things about the metaverse is that, um, following on what Daria said, sorry, the mic wasn't working. Um, I think we think about the idea of inclusivity first and foremost. And then we look at that in the way that we think about developing software because historically all of our software has existed in silos. And I think one of the things that the metaverse and particularly Web3 enables us to do is to bring down some of the walls between those silos so that content can interoperate. And once that content can start to interoperate, you can actually start to think about what it means to own a piece of digital property. Because if I own it, then I should have the right to do what I like with it and bring my stuff with me from place to place because it's mine and I own it. And so as we think about bringing down those walls and collaborating and creating this shared inclusive environment, then what we also do is we are able to en enable creators because we can create an ecosystem where creators can thrive because they have rights over their digital stuff and actually monetize that stuff and sell it and be able to see the fruits of their labor, not just in the vision in front of them, but through financial reward as well of the time that they invest in creating yeah. those things. Um, and I think, obviously, you know, I'm a little bit biased because we are shareholders of Sandbox, so <laughs> I, I will leave it to Sebastian to talk about, about, crea you. about creators. <laughs> <laughs> Sebastian. Well, uh, for us, we see our mission as really truly empowering players and creators. And uh, to do so, we need to make the metaverse as accessible as possible. First, for creators, by providing tools that are like no code, just drag and drop. Imagine like being able to build content just like manipulating digital Legos without any experience learning skills. The second thing that I believe is very important is culturalization. Like metaverse is accessible, it's global, it's accessible from anywhere, but to appeal to uh, like more regular people, it has to be more local. Meaning when we bring brands from 
Southeast Asia, from Korea, from Thailand, from Turkey, from Dubai, from here in Saudi Arabia, and we focus first on entertainment, culture, gaming, music, fashion. We appeal to the fans, we appeal to the younger generation, the Gen Z, who want to come and co-create experiences with their favorite brands or, or uh, celebrities. We also think like for the metaverse to succeed, it has to be fun. And fun means content, great content, new format of entertainment, new social experiences, like it has to be deeply social and connecting in new ways, expressing ourselves with our avatar using emotes and other animation uh, as a new form of expression. And ultimately, to also be meaningful and last, it has to be uh, pushing for a real creator economy where all the users who contribute to build those world, to engage to the success of the platform are the first who benefit from that success. And so uh, we also have the chance to speak with public uh, government, administration, ministries, etc., and we encourage them to recognize true digital asset ownership as a right so that anything you own, you create, you can sell it, you can recognize it, you can earn a revenue from it, and that's going to pave the digital economy for the next 10 and further years. Yeah, and, and, and both of you have actually, and you know, Dere, you mentioned kind of regulatory and, and governments. You know, how do you think governments, uh, and there's a lot happening in, in the region, uh, you know, should be looking at this relative to constituents. Uh, there's the regulatory component uh, to make sure everybody is safe. Uh, but Beverly, I'd love you know, your opinion on, on some of, just how governments are really thinking about the metaverse. Yeah, so what I would say is that, you know, it depends on which piece you're looking at, right? So if you're talking about the economy within the metaverse, the privacy within the metaverse, the, the data and the data protection, right? So each piece of that probably has a different answer to the question. I would say that for us specifically, we're looking at how do you protect that identity? How do you protect your assets? Um, how do you protect yourself, right? And I think that this is a really great opportunity. If you think about it, if we stepped back 10 years and looked at social media differently than we did today, and we had a greenfield opportunity to develop it from the bottom up, it's really incumbent upon each and every one of us and each and every company that's involved because it is a greenfield to do it better than we did it the first time. That would be my perspective. I would also say that because of that, the opportunity to create is massive. Right? And so just from my perspective, we're gonna run a giant competition. We're announcing it today, so you'll see the press release about it. But we're gonna run a contest that's basically for the next billion people. That's also a metaverse competition because the next billion people and the eight billion that are now on the planet are gonna use the metaverse. And so let's do it in a great way. So if you have a great idea, you should come to autonomouscompetitions.com <laughs> because we're taking ideas and we're gonna actually incubate some of those ideas. I, I just wanted to add a couple of points because we've done quite a lot of work yeah, with, with, with governments me. within the region. Um, and, and I think it's a double-edged sword. There's you, the, the organizations themselves need to understand it. And the only way they can understand it is by being part of it. And so platforms like Sandbox are a great way for them to get in and explore and then learn and then yeah. build the regulation for it. Not go all in, but to start to explore to understand what it actually <coughs> means. What does it mean to make a region relevant avatar? What do we actually want it to do, not do? How do we actually build a com conversation with people so that we can actually see how they want to interact? And let's not presume what's gonna be right for someone from this country because someone's in another country's got a different platform. We need to actually build it. And then we've got uh, so much activity happening, which is awesome, but we also, I think, need to help build that, be build the ecosystem at the same time. So I would say explore quickly, but carefully with some good advice and then learn from there. And so everyone's kind of touched on also kind of co-creation, you know, learning from the mistakes that we may have made with social media and the internet. You know, how do we really practically do it? Obviously that's the idea, right? We wanna make sure that, that this is accessible to everyone. Um, but is it toolkits? Is it is it democratization? Is it regulation? Is it all of the above? I mean, how do we, how do, you know, it's one thing to say and another to do it. So, so how do we do it? <laughs> I, th I think if I can offer one idea is, I think often when I struggle to find ways to think about how we can imagine to create a metaverse, I look to the physical world because 
we've been trying to solve the same problems for thousands of years, whether it's the rule of law or other things, right? And so when you think about um, the idea of property ownership, um, a lot of things stem from that property ownership. So you think about things like if I have a shop and I'm a shopkeeper and people come and make trouble in my shop, I'm going to take care of it because it's my shop and I need to take care of that local problem because I own that shop. So I right. feel a sense of responsibility around it. Um, and I think that we can see similar behavior potentially in the metaverse where when you own your own space, you feel empowered and a sense of responsibility and obligation to sort of self-administer your own spaces, yeah. right? And just like the physical world, maybe there are things that need escalating and you need help from somebody else. But a lot of it will be relatively, you know, up to the individual, I think, once they are empowered by having those property rights. I think that's interesting, but, but when we talk about local in the metaverse, mm -hmm. it's a interesting concept because yep. it is infinite and yet I think we will find people, as is evidenced in Sandbox, right, that will want to cluster. Yes. Um, but, but do you think that it will really foster, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in this concept of global village, right? We all have our, our communities in the real world, um, but this is an opportunity to have a chosen community but, but feel connected on a global level. But do you think that we'll just replicate and we'll, we'll be, be very small tribes, or do you think we really can open up a global conversation because this is an infinite landscape. Uh, I'd like to jump on that one. Like, we, we really see like physical and virtual world both part of the real world. Like, we, we don't say real versus virtual. We say physical and virtual now. And we, with our avatars, we can own one or multiple. We are now like global citizens of that virtual world. And that brings two level of like how we want to interact in those worlds. I believe, like, uh, ultimately, users should participate in the governance of those virtual worlds as citizens, so democratically be able to elect people who represent, to self-govern, to self-also, like, organize uh, and moderate and protect the communities that live within those worlds in a compatible way with the existing rule or upcoming rules that regulatory regimes will put in place in various countries. Um, I also think that um, right now a lot of like the metaverse is, is, is already being represented into multiple virtual worlds and each, each one of them in multiple communities. Web3 is a great way to empower, we, say, we very often say Web3 is community driven through the ownership of a digital asset, an NFT, we are part of a community. Through ownership of a land, me and my neighborhood, we are part of another social community. And at the moment, the scale of the metaverse is probably in the region of a million to 10 million users. So we'll need to give it more time to grow, and then the communities also will start to enlarge progressively. Yep. And, and Darius, um, you know, meta arguably has you know, more communities than any other social media environment. Uh, so, so I'm sure you're very well versed in those kinds of behaviors, but are you seeing that kind of translate into worlds like Horizon or even in the way users are using Quest? Um, what, what are some of the trends that you're seeing there? And also many great things have been said. I took some notes. I want to reflect <laughs> on them as well. <laughs> yes. So um, yes, we have a 3.7 billion people on our platforms active. And uh, we expect Metaverse to reach 1 billion people by 2030. So that's pretty close, actually, <laughs> seven years from now. And yeah. that's a bold vision. That's what the trends are saying. And um, I want to say a few things before maybe I come to that. First thing is technology offers opportunities, but also divide. And you, because you mentioned inclusion point, like how do we make it accessible to everyone? And um, because you use technology, you go multiple times faster, you don't use, you stay behind, right? And imagine somebody who was born in a village in Turkey 30 years ago versus somebody who was born in Silicon Valley. There is a big divide at that time, but today everyone with a computer and an internet has much more uh, accession to opportunities. So that's the democratization effect of technology. And that inclusion is important. And one of the things are one of our core values building the metaverse is how do we make it inclusive, devices accessible. That's why we have two layers of devices, like accessible to everyone and pro, 
and uh, how do we uh, enable accession from different services? So you don't only have to have the, um, the headsets, but also you can access it from your mobile phone. And whatever we do, connectivity and internet speed is going to be critical for everyone to access it. And that's why we are laying cables, subsea cable, for example, Africa, connecting Africa to Middle East and Europe to empower 300 million people to access the internet. So I think those components need to get there. So every layer, think about this as a new internet. So every layer from content creation to platforms to both connectivity infrastructure and device infrastructure and the enablers such as payment services, et cetera, that needs to come together. And the reason why it's going to take at least five to 10 more years is that we are waiting semiconductors and processors to get there. We are waiting for optics technology to get, or haptics technology to get there. And you know, there are like many pieces um, you know, moving in different speeds and that's going to uh, be valuable to start thinking about these things from now. So we built this um, research fund, uh, we put $50 million to explore what could be the risks of the metaverse and how can we avoid them together with the industry. Uh, because it's going to enable uh, many opportunities. It's not only um, you know, the business, or the huge business opportunity, because whatever we do today in internet, we sell physical goods, we buy physical goods. But then creators will be able to create the digital copies of everything we buy and sell. That's a massive new economy. And then the digital asset ownership becomes important, NFTs become important, but then we have a sustainability story. <laughs> and in order to make it sustainable, it has to be interoperable. That's what we are pushing for, to build it in an interoperable way. So it's, it's very complex and it requires a lot of discussion and collaboration in the um, industry. But I never believe that it's going to change the physical experiences we have. I will always enjoy talking to my mom and being with my family physically together. But when we cannot be physically together, instead of sending them a letter, as in the past days, or SMSing them, we can be together in a hologram format as if like we are sitting next to each other. So it's really enhancing the physical, in um, the, the digital interactions and more making them close to real instead of replacing the, the physical interactions. So those are a few thoughts that I wanted to add to everyone. Yeah, no, I, I, and I love that. And I think that's right. I think it's it's not a replacement for, it's it's sort of both. It's an all, more is more. Is more. And, and so Beverly, when you're thinking about, I mean, NEOM is the biggest project in yeah, the world. Is. I mean, it's unimaginably large yes. and complex. Uh, but, but what's interesting is that not only are you coming at it from a, a very human standpoint, but, but pushing all of the technology to its absolute boundaries, right? So we're starting to learn things about the technology we didn't think of. You know, do you look at this as being a, a model for how all business and construction and the way we're going to, to kind of merge the physical and the digital in, in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'll say is to your prior question, if we miss this opportunity to make it a global experience, then I think we've missed the opportunity. I, I understand the small localized content and other localized communities, but really this is a gift that we're giving to the world and it's how we use it globally. We can solve lots of problems and communities and the diversity of thought and the inclusiveness of thought that you can't get in any other format, it's the opportunity, it's where I see the opportunity. But to go to your question about Neom specifically, absolutely, right? It is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, when I came, I, I moved from the United States when I got here and I came because I thought it was a change the world opportunity. And now I've been here over two years and I have to tell you it is a change the world opportunity. You know, a lot of people who hear about Neom or hear about the line or hear about autonomous say, oh, well, that's for Saudi Arabia. No, no, this is an experiment that if it works, gives back to every human. And I think that the metaverse is such a compliment. We're in such in our infancy. And Saudi Arabia specifically has this population, 70% under 35 years old, early adopters of technology, high usage, the ability to and to want to work inside of the metaverse. So if we can do that and if we can model that, then I think all sorts of places in the world can utilize it. Not only can you utilize it to have remote medical care, but I have a, a friend's son who now is traveling the world for a year while working in his remote SAP office inside of the metaverse. So it's everything from start to finish and what a great opportunity for us and for mankind. So yes, I hope we are, hope we're the example. Good, good, and I know, you know, Guy, you always temper everything with, you know, go with caution. <laughs> <laughs>
be smart. They're That's why our, they're our partners. <laughs> Blockchain, crypto, identity <laughs> management, data management, lots of challenges, lots of, lots of risks as well. And I think it really is, it's a balanced equation. I, I always start with the exciting use case exploration opportunity. That's where we should always be starting. But as soon as we've identified what are the most relevant things for a user, then to be clear, have we covered all of the other elements? And particularly when we're talking about building new worlds, we have the, the opportunity to build it with design, mm -hmm. to have a, a level of uh, control which is automated into it, to have bad actors that are being automated out of the equation. Um, and and to, to build on the whole communities piece as well, I think we have the opportunity to build these global platforms, but some of the user needs are very localized. Some of them when I want to go and see my doctor and I want my doctor to know me, but I don't want to physically go to my doctor, I need to go into a private environment and then I want that to be controlled. That can be a metaverse experience that then anybody within that locale or even within that country could want to do. So I think. We, we should not be talking about a metaverse, but metaverse technologies which enable so many things, and then there'll be hopefully these interoperable worlds that are at sometimes private, I need an identity card, I need to know where my data is going to go, and at other times completely public like Sandbox, where I know my data is not going to be controlled, I know it's hopefully not going to be used, and so I'm using it in a way that I know it's public. So it's a very different use case, and, and so we will have these different layers and different levels. Yeah, I think you, wanted, you had a I, comment on I, that. I'd like to add something like that. I used to think like we've pretty much explored every inch on Earth, and there was <laughs> not much to discover for the younger generation, except maybe the underneath ocean. And uh, like the new limits was like our imagination. But Neom actually is a great project that give like a new purpose to using all that technology that is a metaverse, that's both like uh, disrupting exactly. the way we interact socially and the way like technology can help us to build city of the future. And I'd love to, to encourage the conversation as well on building Neom in a way that's going to be inclusive of like the feedback from the people who want to live there, the architect, but also the citizen, the future citizen who will choose to elect to live the, there. 100%. Well, I think the contest is a start because it's asking the world, what would you like this to look like? And how, what was, the, exactly. name, what was the, the kind of origin of deciding to do this contest? So we just decided that to get new ideas and to see, you know, some of the best ideas come from like your seven-year-old son or daughter. And so we were like, let's open it up to the whole world and see what the world thinks it should be. Come bring us your ideas and we'll help you incubate it into a business. Now, in general, companies would be absolutely terrified to do something like that because they'll get ideas that seem impossible, but a, a guy I know is already nodding, saying, no, nothing's impossible, we can do all of this. You know, but, but the interoperability piece as well, so being able to kind of synthesize all of these ideas and, and look at how to operationalize them, and interoperability is a big piece of that. And Guy, I'd like to, to, to get your insights, like, what are some of the challenges you're already seeing? Because you're really looking at it from, all right, there's back-end digital twin, which is operationalized, but then you want to have these lyrical, beautiful environments that from a lot of these ideas that you're going to get from the contest. How do you marry that, the, you know, all of that data and, and those experiences? Uh, the way in which we've been building it is based on what the user wants to interact with, needs to interact with. And so when you've got an operator they're less concerned about the wonderful graphics. You actually can control what's going to be their access layer, and often you can put a lot of computing power at that point. But then when you're wanting to sell this dream to somebody that's in the public, they do care about what it's visualized. And, and so in those cases, you need to sometimes control the experience that they can actually receive within that. But then once they go in, it gets significantly better, more rich, more beautiful. And, and you want them to fall in love. You want them to want to come back. The whole point of the metaverse is to create a compelling experience that people want to engage with. And so we have developed them to start with as distinct experiences, and now we're overlapping. And so the concept of the meta twin is where we're starting to see the strategies, because as soon as we spend time with a client, their use cases go, they blend from, I want to engage the public, I then want to have a private experience, and now I want my operators to use the same piece. 
It's all on a similar stack from a technology point of view, but has very different use cases. That's great. Oh, yes. I, I, I was just going to add, actually, I'm going to give a plug for our nonprofit because Sebastian and I sit on the board of something called the Open Metaverse Alliance. And this is basically a, a nonprofit community led project by companies in the Web3 metaverse space where we just decided that we needed to get together and have a forum to talk about how to do this because technically it's, it's very hard and there are lots of legal and social issues. It's very complicated stuff. And so we thought, what better way to start than to come together in a room and at least figure out how we can get each other's projects to talk to each other. And at least then that's a start. And we can experiment amongst each other and hopefully then be open and transparent about how we did it and how other people can connect with our projects and maybe start a little bit of momentum from there. That's excellent. So all of you are visionaries in your own right. So before we finish out today, if you had a blank canvas and a magic wand and you got to write the story of how this amazing technology evolves from a very personal standpoint over the next 20 years, and we get to just project ourselves and we're there, just give us a little snapshot about what that would look like. And so we'll start with you, Guy. Um, I, I believe that we're still going to have amazing physical experiences and interactions when we want to put our goggles on that can be enhanced with an augmented experience over the top. And then when you want to actually dive in and engage with people that aren't going to be around, you can also engage seamlessly with people that you want to around the world and explore and meet others in like-minded communities, etc. Excellent. Beverly, we'll just come right down the line. <laughs> wow, well, I hope that we don't have goggles 20 years from now. <laughs> I hope there's another <laughs> solution. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, goggles, I, mean like this. Okay. I mean glasses, really. Yes. I want them to be seamless. Yes. So my vision's a little bit bigger. I am hoping that right now there's divides across the world, and I'm really hoping that the metaverse allows us to see each other in a different way, in a more human way, and that it brings us together and makes us more cohesive. That's my hope. That's great. I, I hope you get your wish. I'm with you on that. Area. I think te technology-wise, it will be much more seamless. I, I see our headsets. Uh, remember the old mobile phones, the big yeah. ones? Yeah. I think we're at that stage right case. now. It's going to be much It could be glasses or uh, lenses, something. But apart from that, I really wish this technology to uh, advance the humanity and increase empathy and also solve for sustainability, which I believe is the most important problem in the world today. Yeah. Sebastian. I, I really see like creativity has no limits, but what we've seen before is like it's not necessarily in about like the aesthetic or like the realism that's going to win. It's really about like how we provide tools that allow to define a new format of entertainment and people to enjoy having fun creating and sharing and that have given birth to Instagram, to Snapchat, to TikTok. I see in the metaverse within 10 to 20 years, every one of us will have one or multiple digital avatars who will be interacting across many virtual worlds, will potentially earn more, uh, a part if not all our revenue from digital activities and the overall digital economy would have surpassed the physical world economy. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think following on from that, I think when we think about what people will do in the metaverse, hopefully they will do everything. So they will be entertained, they will work, they will be educated, they will communicate with each other. And so I think it's less important how we think about accessing the metaverse, but that we can actually provide the infrastructure, both technical and financial and legal, so that they can actually engage in all those activities. Because if you think about the transformational effect on the economy, if we, as Sebastian said, have a physical world and a virtual world, if the virtual world becomes as large as the physical from an economic standpoint, then we've done the world a great service. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but, but it's interesting that thematically, uh, everyone touches on the human component. And, and instead of just technology for technology's stake, really looking at where we want to be as humans in 15, 20, 100 years, mm -hmm. and using technology to backfill. You have been a spectacular panel. I wish we had another hour to continue. Uh, but thank you all so much. Thank you all for joining us today. And again, uh, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for writing.